focus on is a preservation effort um, in, in Northwestern Illinois that started out as a field school and then the Archaeological Conservancy became involved. And then it ended up bringing in a local land trust, which took on a whole series of preservation efforts focused on cultural heritage as well as natural areas and also involvement of uh, Native American groups in the Midwest. And this, this whole process ended up preserving over a thousand acres of cultural resources in Northwestern Illinois in Joe Davies County. And it all started out with some, some research along the Apple River and, and as I said, the involvement of the Conservancy early on. And I wanna kind of discuss the archeology span and how looking at some of these sites has helped us comprehend and understand Native American historical dynamics in the upper Midwest but also run through how very simple events and processes and meetings of people can lead to, to really wide ranging and, and impacts over, over a large area. The area I wanna talk about is, uh, is located in, in Northwestern Illinois, and it's part of the Driftless area, which, which any of you who travel through the Midwest or well aware, it's, it's, it's known stereotypically as a land of flat and rolling corn and soybean fields, uh, but it's actually much more diverse than that. And there's an area of the Midwest in the upper Mississippi River Valley called the Driftless Area, which was not leveled by glaciers, which means that it's a very ancient landscape that's rugged, it's heavily dissected, um, and it's beautiful. And it has a very unique set of uh, natural environments as well as a cultural heritage for uh, Native American people who lived in this area over many millennia. Uh, I grew up in this area. I grew up near Galena, Illinois, um, in a very eclectic family that was interested in geology and history and and um, and all these subjects. So I got taken around on this landscape a lot by my relatives and family and told stories about places and what went on there and where Native American burial mounds were and where family had had lived or mined or farmed or worked. And so I became very, very tied to this landscape. And as I became interested in archaeology in high school, after spending some some summer time down in Campsville, at the Center for American Archaeology, I started surveying and looking for sites in that area. I was, I was pretty much a nerd and a geek in high school, so I spent a lot of my time hiking the bluffs and, and looking, looking for archaeology sites, um, and a lot of this I did with my father, <coughs> mother, and other relatives. Um, the driftless area, as you can imagine, like most parts of North America, is completely inscribed with the Native American past. There are fields are full of the stone tools left over from campsites and villages and, and towns. There are rock shelters everywhere in the, in the valleys uh, for, for, for habitation in the winter. And the bluff tops and high hills of the area are covered with very visible burial mounds, often overlooking habitation area that make a very, uh, prominent pronouncement that we are here and our ancestors are here. And these, these cover the landscape. The, there's also rock art and other archeological um, you know, remains within the Driftless area. And it's a very unique and it's a, it's a very, very special place. Even in post-contact times, um, the, the history of that area for native peoples is unique. Um, in much of Eastern North America, the frontier and, and it's, it's kind of violence and genocide and removal and all the conflicts are involved with start out very much involved in, in the fur trade between Euro-Americans and, and Native Americans. And that for sure was going on in Northwestern Illinois and other places, but there was a, a twist to that story in that there were deposits of lead that were available, especially to the Meskwaki and the Ho-Chunk and other tribes in the area and they mined and they smelted and they traded this lead and it wasn't something that was done as kind of a side venture in relation to other things. These were really substantial 
industrial scale productions on, on a really impressive scale. And, and this is just one example of, of a Meskwaki lead mine north of my hometown in Galena. You can see my father standing in the trench there, but it's, it's a trench that's 30 feet deep and, and 300 feet long. I mean, that's a very substantial mining operation. So, so these, this whole area has, has a, has a unique and, and interesting history. It's di different from other areas. Um, but I want to kind of back up in time before go here and go back to She's about, um, about a, a thousand AD, maybe 900 AD. And I want to kind of lay the framework for some of the sites we're going to talk about. Um, at that time, you, you, you're, you're nearing the end of what archaeologists refer to as broadly as effigy mound culture that subsumes a whole bunch of regional and variations. But it's, it's thrown around generally to describe late woodland societies in southern Wisconsin, northern Illinois, eastern Iowa, southeast Minnesota that were hunters and gatherers and gardeners, but also were constructing these fairly massive uh, uh, burial mound complexes, and many of them were in the shape of animals, which reflected likely clan affiliations, um, um, tribal societies, and also the cosmology and the beliefs of the builders. And, and we obviously don't understand all of this, but I'm biased, but I think it's one of the most fascinating kind of historical archaeological Kind of monumental projects in history is that you have a people putting their belief system in these huge earthen monuments literally all across the landscape. Um, toward the end of effigy mound period, and, and again, when I talk about woodland or effigy mound or Mississippian, I'm talking as an archaeologist that this isn't, we're talking about how we've organized sets of material remains to communicate with each other it doesn't necessarily correlate to, to ethnic groups in the way people saw themselves, obviously. But toward the end of the effigy mound period or the woodland period in the Midwest as a whole, you begin to see some stresses on resources and some, some, some evidence of, of strain on, on the environment. You begin to see more fortified villages. Um, there's, there's issues cropping up which are straining traditional ways of doing things and people are looking at at how to how to deal with these changes and and in the in the south people develop a series of cultures that a lot of you are familiar with referred to as mississippian and these groups lived in much larger fortified towns with with public plazas and large platform mounds for elites or religious structures and were much more reliant on domestic agricultural crops than, than their, their woodland ancestors. When you, when you move in toward 1100, 1150, 1200 AD, you begin to see a Mississippian presence north of large sites like Cahokia into the upper Mississippi Valley. And those influences were either related to people migrating or ideas moving or people from the north visiting these, these growing powerful centers or an amalgamation of, of all these things going on. We, it, it's not just a simple kind of migration displacement uh, that we used to think it was. Um, but so we want to kind of focus on that time period between, you know, we're talking 1050, maybe into 1250, 1300, where you have these Mississippian influences in the north and you have indigenous woodland people borrowing, um, amalgamating, choosing to be part of this system or to reconfigure it on their own terms in different ways. And it's a very, very dynamic period. And one thing we've learned is anywhere you look at this happening, the way it plays out is very different. There's no cookie cutter response to to, to what's happening at this time period. What we do know as a result of these dynamics, by the end of that period, there's a series of new cultures across the Midwest that 
archaeologists, again, very generally refer to as Oneota, and I don't want to jump down the rabbit hole of defining that, but these were cultures which, which contain various parts of, of woodland Mississippi and traditions as well as, as new creations, and these came to dominate much of the upper Midwest by the time of, of European contact. And some of these groups may well be ancestral to, to Siouan groups we know, such as the Iowa or the Ho-Chunk or the Oto and, and other groups. Again, there's a lot, of, a lot of debate over these associations and tracing back into time, but we do know that the, the societies that Europeans contacted were, were down the line the result of some of these dynamics and, and what had happened centuries before in the upper Mississippi Valley. What I want to focus on is a series of sites in one of these places, which are located near the mouth of the Apple River in northwestern Illinois. The Apple River winds through the hills of Joe Davies County, and it comes into the Mississippi River. And in near the mouth of that river are a whole series of very dense indigenous woodland sites from the end of the effigy mound period. And there's also a series of small homesteads and, and large platform mound villages that appear to be very Mississippian related, at least with site layout and architecture and some of, some of the, the artifacts there. And, and if you look at the Driftless area, if, you, if the talk ends and you're, you're fascinated by this, look at the Driftless area ge geographically and you'll see that it's kind of a big inverted triangle. And the point of that triangle is at the Apple River. And the fact that there's all this dynamics going on at the mouth of the Apple River and some similar but different, if that makes sense, kind of dynamics going on in the Red Wing area at the northern end of the Driftless area, I don't think that's coincidental. Um, Robert Boshart and Jim Thieler have talked at length about this and, and what this means for native populations in this region and their historical trajectory. But we want to focus on several several of these sites. And, and when I started walking this area in high school um, and, and reading some of the earlier works, it was apparent that people have been aware of these unique Mississippian related sites in the north um, since the uh, late 19th century. Pioneer uh, W. B. Nickerson stated straight out in his reports to uh, the Peabody Museum that there are sites on the Apple River that belong down south and, and in the southern states. And he did work at these sites. Uh, the University of Chicago under uh, Fay Cooper Cole did their first archeology span work in Joe Davies County. They worked on some of these sites in the late 20s and early 30s, trying to make, make sense of what was going on here in relation to Aztalan and other places that were Northern Mississippian sites. So there was a long history of people looking at these sites. And, and I talked to a lot of local collectors when I was younger. I also walked these sites. In 1998, I was able to do an archeological survey of a lot of the lower Apple River Valley. And what became apparent from that survey was that there were a lot more Mississippian and, and terminal woodland or end of the effigy mound period woodland sites in that area than we had known before. It was basically the entire river valley, its bluff tops, its terraces, was one enormous archeological site. Um, so it was a more complex picture than what we had thought. Um, this image shows one of those sites back in the 90s, the John Chapman site, and where local collectors had found marine shells, Cahokia-related ceramics, uh, Mill Creek hose, other artifacts that attested to a very Mississippian-related occupation. Um, you can see in that picture a bump in that cultivated field. That is a plowed down platform mound, most likely. Um, in 2003, I was, I was, I was working through uh, my graduate studies at the University of Illinois and, um, and, and had the chance to do field work for, for my dissertation. And my, my advisor, Dr. Tim Pocketat, was willing to bring his well-known Cahokia Field School north to the Apple River for, for the summer. And 
with funding provided by Dr. Tom Emerson of ISAS, supervision by uh, Jeffrey Cruckton, we were able to bring students to the John Chapman site to test one of these Mississippian sites and see what, what actually was there. Because it was, it was critical to do at that time because the, the Chapman site, one of these larger Mississippian sites, was for sale. The owners, Ken and Judy Williams, were under intense pressure from banks to sell off property holdings to pay farm debt. And I wanted to see if there were intact features at this site and see if, or has this all just been cultivated over 180 years and it's a bunch of material in the plow zone. So what we did was we brought the students there and, and we we stripped off the, the, the plow zone with, with a backhoe very carefully until we were reached the subsoil, the unplowed area, and could see feature stains. And lo and behold, what was there were a series of houses and pit features that were intact. And so it showed that this large site and probably its plowed down mounds and its occupational areas was intact. And this is an aerial view looking down on those excavations in in 2003. This, this collage here just shows students watching the backhoe as it removes increments of, of uh, disturbed plow zone, students mapping um, features and, and the, uh, the activity of screening material for, for artifacts. This shows um, a profile of a large roasting pit as well as a plan of a house and a map showing those houses. Um, for any of you who are familiar with Mississippian material, you'll immediately realize that those are not wall trench houses, which are standard on large Mississippian sites in central Illinois River Valley, Cahokia, other areas to the south. These are basins with single posts, much as the local woodland tradition had built for many centuries, which is interesting. The artifacts from from these excavations are really fascinating because you have a lot of what you would expect, arrow points, you have a lot of end scrapers, which are common for sites up north that have interactions with woodland and Mississippian people. And the ceramics are also very telling because you have examples, for instance, in the middle here of a very polished, very hard, pieces of a vessel which are probably coming out of out of Cahokia. Um, and then you have you have local copies of this where people are inscribing Mississippian motifs and designs into wet clay instead of leather hard clay. And you can see the intaglio of, of that in the reverse when you flip those over. So the local copies are are a little different. There is also not a lot, but there is some terminal woodland or indigenous woodland ceramics, which tend to be castellated or, or collared and, and corded uh, materials that are grit tempered instead of shell tempered. Um, and there are also some exotic ceramics, including uh, Mill Creek pottery from a society in Northwest Iowa at the time that had a lot of contacts with Mississippians and a lot of exchange of marine shell, which may account for the large shell pieces found on these sites over the years instead of just, just beads. I think they were being processed there and they were making their way to other allied communities out in the, the eastern plains and to the north. Aside from these kind of ceramics, you also have a set of vessels that kind of blend Mississippian and woodland kind of kind of shapes as well as surface treatment and, and the incision of new sorts of nested designs there. And I think what we're seeing here is we're seeing local people reconfiguring their site layout and, and, and some of their artifact assemblage in a, in a Mississippian way, but they're keeping traditional architecture and other forms of, of, of subsistence and ways of living and they're kind of they're playing with 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 the cultural dynamics of the time, and what what ends up resulting down the line is 
is one of these cultures that, that Midwestern archaeologists refer to as, as Oneota that I mentioned earlier. There are collections of material from other Apple River sites and sites close by um, in Sabula, Iowa and across the river that have, they're definitely Oneota sites. I think they're probably the descendants of these people. Um, but what's interesting is, is as an archaeologist, you know that you, you rarely get a chance in the material culture to see this change because it happens so fast. You, you, you have a set of kind of cultural, dare I call them norms or ways of producing, you know, material remains and, and what you're using and change happens fast. And the next time you see it in the archeological record, it's different and it gets labeled a different culture or phase or whatever. Well, it's, it's, it's the same people, but they're, 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 they're not fossilized. They're changing over Time. And what's neat here is we actually caught that snapshot that shows that change over time that will help us understand some of the dynamics of, the, of this history. When we did these excavations uh, and it became apparent that uh, these, these uh, features were still present, what we did was um, we had a visit by my mentor, Dr. Paul Gardner, the, the former uh, Midwest director, and he came and visited the site. And he talked with the landowners and, and we were able to have a discussion and they were impressed with the, uh, the archeology span and the value here. And even though the, the banks were really turning the screws on them, they took the site off the market so that it could be purchased by the Archaeological Conservancy. And then the Conservancy held it until a local land trust named the Joe Davies Conservation Foundation could buy it. And in that interim, there was a geophysics survey of the site, including the plowed down platform mound. And here you can see some of the structures which are still intact. This mound was a favorite of collectors. Um, because of the marine shell beads that were plowed out, but it does have intact stratigraphy. There was also a controlled surface collection later to identify other major habitation areas across the, uh, the terrace. But the holding of the property for, for the Joe Davies Conservation Foundation to buy was really something unique. They're a land trust, they deal with natural conservation. That's their, that was their mission at the time. And they were raising money to buy what in essence was a giant cornfield. Um, it was it was fantastic archaeologically, but this was kind of outside um, their their mission statement. But they did it, and they committed themselves to the funding for restoring this prairie, um, which is now by the Field Museum considered one of the most species diverse prairies in in the state. It's beautiful, and there are public trails and signage. And if you can walk it in the summer, it is gorgeous. You will learn a lot and you will see a prairie that is unlike many that you get a chance to see. It is really impressive. Now locally, what, what this, this did was it changed Joe Davies Conservation Foundation, I'll just say JDCF's mission. And they decided to include cultural heritage um, as part of their mission, along with natural resources, which is really risky for them and, and revolutionary. Most archaeologists are doing their thing, cultural, you know, heritage, you know, natural conservationists are doing theirs. And it, it's rare that there's collaboration at this kind of level. And what they did was over the next several years, they purchased the, the Keo Bluff Preserve, the Casper Preserve with effigy mounds, the 300 acre portage site with a huge middle woodland and late woodland mound group, as well as other sites. And by 2012, they owned over a thousand acres because of cultural resources. That's not including natural preserves and easements and all this other work that they're doing, but over a thousand acres is preserved for its cultural resources and being restored into native habitat. And that snowball effect all came out of just one meeting at a summer field school between the conservancy and the local landowners and the archeologists working there. And when I grew up, I 
I knew these sites and I spent a lot of time on them. And as I went through school, I kind of came to the realization that I would probably see most of them leave in my life. They would be destroyed, altered, um, suffer the fate many archeological sites do. But in fact, a lot of the main key sites in the county have been preserved. I was completely wrong. And, and this all came out of this initial, um, you know, conservancy involvement and interest in, in the, the field work being done there. I want to return back to that property in specifically. That became what was called the Wapalo Preserve, named after a local Meskwaki leader from the 1820s. Um, and what happened after that was we knew from the archaeological record that there was this Mississippian site, John Chapman at the Wapalo Preserve, and the, the property to the south, the Grace Chapman property, held a large mound group over 24 mounds that appeared to be purely woodland. Um, these mounds had been recorded along with an effigy by famed surveyor T.H. Lewis in 1888, and he published a small article that mentioned them. And they were later visited by the University of Chicago in 1926. Some of their first archaeology was trenching through some of these mounds. And um, I've looked through some of these field notes. It's, it's frustrating. There aren't a lot of profiles or details, but it's apparent from the photographs and what is written that what they continued to encounter were these debris-filled mounds that covered large pits filled with either feasting debris or domestic debris of some kind. And this is an example of some of this excavation going on in the 20s. Here's one of the deep pits measuring the, measuring the depth of it. These are a midden of animal remains and pot sherds and, and stone tools that was within one of these pits. Here's another example of that. Here's a drawing of some of the ceramics that were found. And you can see that they look different than what I showed previously with the, the John Chapman site. There were certainly woodland ceramics in that assemblage. This assemblage is all woodland, grit tempered, cord marked, cord impressions, nested cord impressions. And it's referred to, Fred Finney has called this grant wear after a terminal woodland Mississippian related site to the north in, in Grant County, Wisconsin. But the assemblage is purely woodland. And, and this is, this was really interesting, but it was all considered for many years that this was just a woodland mound group. Um, that land over 70 acres became, um, went on the market for sale in 2014 or 15. And the, the Joe Davies Conservation Foundation purchased it. They realized it was the next big terrace um, to the south of Wapolo. It contained a site which was important and it could be a continuation of this prairie preserve. So before they put it in prairie, we did a controlled surface collection of the site with uh, the volunteers um, who work with the Wapolo site from Hanover, uh, JDCF staff. We had three or four school districts involved and any number of volunteers who, who braved some very wet and cold and rainy days to do this surface collection. Um, and what we found was that it wasn't just a, a woodland mound group that there was there, but there's a very dense village or habitation site associated with it. And also, of course, there are earlier woodland, archaic, and even late paleo cultures represented. Uh, this gentleman you see in the slide, uh, Jonathan James, was a student who was working with one of the school groups, and he was taking his time on, on the survey line because he was breaking apart all the clods of dirt that because he wanted to find something. And the teachers kept kept uh, badgering him to move along, move faster, move quicker. He was holding everything up. And finally, he, he gave up and decided it was time to rejoin the group. But he broke open one more clod. And he's like, I think this might be something. And, and it was a, a late Paleo-Indian uh, projectile point. So, so we have a whole suite of occupations across this terrace. And 
this just shows an example of some of some of the stone tools that, that we found from from different time periods. And of course, we also found small triangular points and grit tempered ceramics related to this dense woodland habitation site that was there. Another thing we found on the northern end of this field were uh, small triangular points and end scrapers, very, very uh, similar to what was found at the Chapman site. And it looked like from the surface collection that there was a little bit of a gap between that material and the, the, the woodland village and mound to the south. The next phase in, in, in this work before the prairie was planted was uh, Dr. Tim Horsley uh, came and with um, a series of uh, volunteers, um, he did some geophysical survey across this terrace. And, and I won't go into detail with, with into, into his, his, his results, um, but it was what he was able to show was not only are there likely mound remnants there, but also features related to to houses, um, um, pla possible plazas, pit features, some possible post circles. That this community is 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 large and it's it's complicated. Um, these are a few uh, images that uh, Dr. Horsley. Uh, let us use uh, generously. They're a little bit blurry. I kind of kept them that way just because of the sensitive nature of, of the features. But you can see on this that there are a, a whole mass of features related to that earlier recorded mound group and, and the habitation village that sat around it. If you look on the north end of that, you will also see that there are on the north and east end uh, some some mounded areas that seem to have rectangular internal features. And those are probably, um, especially the northern one, probably plowed down platform mounds. And this is really interesting because combined with the, the surface material, it looks like the John Chapman site does not actually, as to be expected, magically end at a property line, but it continues to the south. And it is not a Mississippian or Woodland Mississippian community centered around one mound and an empty public plaza area on the north, but there's actually actually likely two mounds there that, that frame that community, much as you see um, in other Mississippian communities to the south. So that changes our idea of how that how that community was laid out. Um, the, the Grace Chapman Mounds, the woodland site, makes it really clear that our previous ideas of Mississippian people or ideology moving into areas and how it interacted with the local people was, um, it's a lot more complicated than, than what we had previously thought. So I want to let people think about that for a minute. And then I want to, again, jump across this landscape. And if you look at this topographic map, you'll see on the west side of the river, the Mississippian site, the John Chapman site, um, as 12, the Grace Chapman Mounds and Village is 10. We have to alter some of those boundaries after Dr. Horsley's uh, geophysical work, um, which, and I want to, Put your attention across the river to to the west side of the river, uh, where where it's relatively blank. That property also close to 90 acres became available to Joe Davies Conservation Foundation to purchase, which they did. In 2017 and 18, we did another surface collection with volunteers across that terrace, and we found something very similar to what we'd seen across the river, a whole series of, of occupations by Native American cultures over the many millennia and many different cultural configurations. Um, and so what we have here, if you look at this picture, it shows the, 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 the sites on this newest property. But then if you look across the river, you can see the Wapolo Preserve and then to the south of it, the uh, the uh, Wayland property, which became an addition to that. 
So what we've actually been able to do is preserve an entire landscape of almost 300 acres of terrace, which not only contains a whole series of habitation sites, but mound groups and plaza communities that capture this really dynamic time that impacted the history of, of native peoples in the upper Mississippi Valley. And, and this is a rare thing. Usually when most of you know, when you do preservation, you get the grassy knoll, you get a fragment of a site, or maybe you get one site. And, and that's fantastic. It's rare that you can just over the course of 10 years acquire an entire landscape which captures such critical events in, in, in uh, Native American history. One of the really rewarding uh, parts of this growing project has been that we have been able to work with the Ho-Chunk on, on interpreting these sites and what these sites mean to contemporary people and descendant communities today. Last year, we were able to host a conference um, in the Galena area uh, that where represent, representatives of the Ho-Chunk and the Iowa and the, the Sauk and Fox and others came and participated with how to interpret these sites and how these places in the Driftless area are still viewed by descendants today, even though they may be living in Kansas or Oklahoma or Wisconsin or, or elsewhere. And so this is an ongoing discussion which is going on and is kind of guiding the process of how we move forward with, with these preserves and with their presentation. Um, so I kind of want to just leave um, everyone with the idea of, of how important these sites are to understanding uh, Native American history and, and kind of its dynamics during a very fluid time of cultural change and also how Many times we can, especially now, despair when we look at our, our situation and say, well, what can I do? Or what is this little effort we are involved in locally gonna do in the big picture? And, and when it comes down to it, you don't know, but there is a good chance that, that things as small as, as a site visit or bringing people to a site, be it the Archeological Conservancy or a land trust or Native American groups, can lead to things which you cannot envision in the present. It can lead to things like what's happened here where you have a massive preservation project that all came out of a summer field school and, and my mentor, Paul Gardner, coming by to take a look at this site. Nobody would have imagined that this is where it would have led, but it did. So, so go out there and, and, and do what you can to, to preserve some of these sites. Um, I'll sign off here. Um, if any of you are, are still awake and you're really interested in these sites, um, JDCF, the organization I mentioned, which is local and which purchased the John Chapman site from the Archaeological Conservancy, is having an event as a fundraiser coming up. And I'm going to be looking at a collection from that site that a local person um, had acquired and discussing that with, with the audience. And I'll just leave this slide here for a minute. If anybody wants to participate on JDCF's Facebook page, uh, they are welcome to do that. It's October 3rd at, at 1 p.m. and we can talk more about the material remains, the preservation efforts, tax role in this, um, or whatever, whatever you like. And with that, I think I will uh, sign off and go from there. Thank you. So if anybody has any questions, um, into the question of the, of the app and uh, Phil can answer anything that you want to know. April, I'm searching for chat again. <laughs> Um, if you go to the very bottom right hand corner of the application, there's a little button that says chat. And if you click on that, it should bring it up. Okay. Yeah. I'm in my slideshow. Let me. Okay. I can learn to understand you much better if I can get familiar with the way you talk. I need your permission to help. I can learn to understand you. So, so far, I don't see any questions. You might be off the hook, Phil. 
<laughs> um. <laughs> um, someone's asking if we can send out the information for the October 3rd event and we would be happy to do that. Okay, okay. Yeah, I'm uh Okay, let me see. Ooh, here we go. We're starting to get some questions. Okay. Yeah, I'm Just one second. No problem. Yeah, I'm I'm seeing the slideshow and I'm I'm looking for there's chat. There it is. Okay. So it looks like we have three questions in the Q and A portion. <laughs> okay, I can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, let me go up here. I'm happy to read off the questions to you if you'd like, Phil. Okay. If it would make it easier for you. Oh, can you, is the first one I see here? Can you give an estimate amount of? dollars is expended in the preservation efforts you described boy um the original uh 70 acres i think was um i'm trying to remember maybe it was thirty five hundred dollars an acre i think the prairie seed alone was was several hundred thousand dollars um there's been a whole series of uh grant monies for for seeding, for preservation of the mussels uh, in the river. Um, we tried to like kind of uh, use, you know, conservation, natural monies, as well as, you know, monies related to the archeological um, um, remains to, to do some of this preservation work. But I would guess if you added everything up as far as um, archeology, span purchasing the land, seed, um, all the, the man hours, you're you're well over a million dollars at least. Uh -oh. Okay, could could you hear the answer? Yes. Okay, okay. All right. Okay, and then I see there's an article about where did the money come from? Um, it came from a lot of different sources. Um, there was a lot of grants applied for, for um, the, uh, the um, from the Grand Victoria Foundation that JDCF applied for. Um, in this process, I meant to mention, we were able to uh, get the site on the National Register, which also helped like with, with gaining funding. Um, we kind of used any any means necessary. When Paul was involved with the project initially, um, there were some some very rare mussels located in the Apple River. Um, these allowed access to funding for for the site that that wasn't even related to cultural resources. So we basically kind of reached out to any source we could find for whatever whatever reason. Uh, and one one thing this project showed us locally and JDCF and, and others was that when you when you combine interest, whether it's people's donations or funding agencies, when you combine natural and cultural conservation together, you cast a much wider net of interest as well as people and organizations willing to give money. Um, that it's a really, really good formula for or because there are, there are monies related to, to cultural 
resources that can be helpful for people doing doing natural conservation. And for us archaeologists, we're always crying about money, but we also often have these parcels of land that if we would take care of them and rehabilitate them and put them into in, into native um, plant communities, there would be funding sources available that like w we don't know about. But by partnering with those those kinds of organizations, um, we can we can work work with them and, and do that. I see, uh, do Clovis period findings ever occur in the Driftless area? Uh, yes, there, there's Clovis um, points that have been found in Joe Davies County. A lot of them are, are sort of on the, the edge of the Driftless area, but they're, they, they have, been, have been found there. Uh, for the individual asking uh, this question, um, I would definitely uh, reach out to uh, Dr. Tom Label at ISAS, who um, is is an expert on Paleo Indian and has done work on sites in the in the Driftless area from that time period. And he's a great resource, and he keeps um, a good database and a and a good set of research going on that topic. and And he's the person who could really answer that in detail. But yes, there are very early Paleo Indian remains in parts of the Driftless area. Uh, what evidence is there for Oneo to Mississippian connection? Um, boy, that, that question makes me want to run out the door. Um, that's a really complicated one because it, it, it's obvious that after this period of dynamics um, in the upper Mississippi Valley and upper Midwest, later on you have this whole suite of cultures um, referred to as Oneota, which are, are are, share a whole similarity of traits with with woodland and Mississippian people, and there's been very um, vociferous debate about among archaeologists about what was Oneota developing in the north, along with early Mississippian societies. Is it a result of this influence? Is it something totally indigenous? And that debate goes on and on, especially as our our term Oneotas uh, gets more broadly expanded, but. Focusing back on this local area, I think when you look at the uh, at the very the very end of this sequence on the Apple River, um, um, and and Tom, Dr. Tom Emerson has laid out a series of phases, and his last one is kind of a tentative savanna complex. It covers some sites at the mouth of the Apple River, and there's also some other ones. Uh, at Sabula and across the river that I mentioned in Iowa, where the ceramics are very much look, they look Oneota. They don't look Mississippian or woodland. And I could be wrong. I don't think that's an intrusive, small Oneota population. I think those are the descendants of the people who are at John Chapman and Mills and Lundy and some of these other sites that we, we see up a little bit up the Apple River earlier on. We should probably just take a couple more, Phil. It's almost, uh, it's right around six o'clock, so. Uh-oh, you're muted, hold on. Uh-oh. There you okay. are. All right, now people won't be as confused. <laughs> <They don't laughs> hear me. How long you're back. Did, okay, how long roughly did the people stay in one village or they move from one to another and then return again? Um, a lot of these communities show evidence of structures being re rebuilt. Um, we had some overlap at sites like Lundy. Um, you see it at the Fred Edwards site up in, in Grant County, but you don't see the, the overlap one structure on top of the other masses of them in these upper Mississippi Valley sites, at least in the Southern part, like you do in other places. So I would guess that, you know, you would have people in an area for, for 20, 30 years maybe um, that would require a structure rebuild or two, um, and then and then the village would be moved. Um, that's that's kind of a guess based on ethnography and kind of the architectural um, evidence left in the ground. But we we often look at these places from this time period when we see them in a museum. Everything's green and covered with trees, and it always looks like the Garden of Eden. 
but people are people and they have to use resources where they live. And when you're cultivating land intensively, you're hunting, you're gathering, and you're using wood in practically everything you do, there's gonna come a point where your your the area around your your village or your your site or where you're living is not um, is not uh, you know no longer you're going further and further away to sustain yourself and then you can you can move that village if it doesn't split on its own or butt off into several communities and people were also you know may not have been in one of these main villages everybody all year there may have been groups of people going out seasonally to different areas. To, to harvest and bring back resources. But again, like all environments, there's limits to it. And, 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 and you can either stay there as humans and completely destroy it and, and suffer the consequences, or you can move on somewhere else or alter how you're living. Um, but it, it looks like one of our issues with interpreting some of these sites is that we don't have enough archeology span done across these large sites with dates to really we don't have the detailed kind of sequence like you see in the American bottom. So when we look at a terrace like the Apple River with the John Chapman site spread across it, it's like, are we looking at one great big site or is this, you know, four generations moving across this terrace, reconfiguring the site um, as, you know, as cultural change happens? We don't, we don't know that. So this, this is a, this is a difficult question that we don't we don't have the answer to. It'll only be after after more work that we can address it. We're probably good. At, we're probably about time set, but I did copy in uh, some of the Q and A questions that we didn't get to in the chat, okay. so I can send that to you. Bill with some email addresses so that you can talk to people offline. Okay. So. All right. Thank okay. you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. We hope you'll come to the next one. We'll be announcing the next one soon. Thank you.